Driving and Dragons, and today I'm coming to you to start a little bit of a series on Rule Zero. I did a video just the other day on Rule, Z on rule Zero and what it is and why it's important, just kind of a Rule Zero primer, and I got to thinking about it that really at the end of the day, there is nothing more important for a, an aspiring game master to understand than the importance of rule zero and how to use it. From the classic Dungeons and Dragons DM's guide where it says that the dungeon master's discretion is the final say on all rules and mechanics matters all the way up to every other system on the planet. The, the number one rule is that what the game master, keeper, referee, DM says goes. And that is very, very important. Um, as a matter of fact, to me, that's the end of all conversations with the uh, with the notorious rules lawyer is. You want to talk about rules? The number one rule is what the DM says goes. And it's important because this is the key tool that separates the game master that can't keep a group together that is always losing players, that can't seem to make the game fun, and even really struggles to run pre-written modules from the game master who seems to be able to always craft these great worlds and can seemingly pull a crazy one-shot campaign out of their out of their butt. And everybody has a blast, no prep, no nothing, yanks it out of his back pocket, half asses it together. Somehow it's always a blast, even if it's a complete disaster in terms of storytelling and development and everything, and half doesn't make sense, why is it still a blast? The reason is because they understand how to use that discretion to, to work on the mechanics. Today, I'm going to talk about using Dungeon Master's Discretion, Rule Zero, whatever you want to call it, for pacing. And I start, and I don't mean pacing of a story so much as I mean pacing of the game itself. Now, I pick pacing to start with, as opposed to something that a lot of people would say is more important, like consistency, because I believe pacing is where rule zero has the most impact on every table, and is most important for a GM. Ironically, rule zero started with Dungeons and Dragons, and Dungeons and Dragons is probably the game that needs it the least. I'm not saying that there aren't crunchier systems out there with more rules and more details than Dungeons and Dragons, but as a general rule, the, that epic high fantasy hack and slash, very uh, structured and ordered classes, races, abilities based on uh, on the same, that system lends itself to needing a lot less discretion, a lot less judgment from the game master, because at the end of the day, there is some kind of rule that you can look up to kind of adjust something. There is that more rigid framework that can that can be used to kind of help things out. And even if it's not the rule is already there the way you want it, you've got enough framework around it that it's easy to build off of. Whereas when you have some of these games that are more, um, a little bit more amorphous, a little bit less rigid, um, so like a lot of your skill-based systems like Call of Cthulhu or Cyberpunk, where you've just got a lot more nebulous uh, characterization, ways to build your character and whatnot, and a lot more nebulous rules in a lot of ways. Those systems, it relies on it a lot more. It's, you have to have an ability to kind of think out those decisions and how you're going to use those rules. So when I say pacing in this context, I am talking specific, specifically about the pacing of gameplay. So... Let's say that you're going to run a suspenseful horror game. Halloween's only a couple months away. Maybe you're thinking about that Halloween game you're going to run. I don't care if you're running Ravenloft. I don't care if you're running Curse of Strahd. I don't care if you are running a homebrew game that you're writing yourself. No matter what it is, if you are running a suspense and horror based game you gotta slow things down matter of fact it's a, it's a fine line to dance between slowing it down so much the players start getting bored but still slowing it down enough to generate the kind of suspense and tension you want because with horror 
that slow movement matters. I refer to pacing in the game as the ticking of the clock. And I use it that way because think about it. When you hear the second hand clicking on, ticking on a clock, that can be a suspenseful slow build. That can be a harrowing, absolutely adrenaline pumping, pounding fast race. Just think about it. When you think about a clock and a suspenseful movie, where everybody's sitting around and waiting, and you can hear it tick, 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 tick. And you can hear the thump, thump, and you can almost feel the pulse beating in their head along with the tick of the clock. And you can feel it building because you're waiting for that second that doesn't end. You're waiting for that space between ticks of the clock to find out when the next piece is going to fall. And that, that anxiety is building up. That is the exact same ticking clock that you get when there's a bomb about to go off and you hear tick, 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 tick. And each one is a second further away. It's like, I just lost another one. I just lost another one. I just lost another one. What am I going to do? It's going to blow up. I got to get this done. Same mechanic, same thing. Ticking of the clock is influencing the story a different way or in this case, influencing mechanics a different way. So always ask yourself, which clock am I looking for? in this scene? Which clock am I looking for in this game? Do I want the clock ticking slow or do I want the clock ticking fast even though they're both ticking off seconds? So in that horror game you want that slow clock. You want them hoping, am I going to make it to the next tick? Oh man, they ticked again. Okay, that second went by with nothing. Man, what's going to happen in the next second? Oh man, I made it through. Alright, you want that. And how do you do that? You do that by controlling the mechanics by guiding your players into making more precise decisions. This is where having 15 similar skills matters. Because maybe climb will work, but climb isn't exactly what you need here. You need mountaineering on the face of a mountain. Climb will work, not as well. We want to be real careful about this. Maybe we maybe we want to have a more detailed approach. I'm not saying if you're going to do search on search checks on a rope, you're going to search every square foot with a different role. You don't want to make it tedious and arbitrary. But what you do want to do is you want to use those mechanics. You want to have more roles. You want to have more checks of different things for different avenues to try and approach something want to be more precise about what can be used where and you're making those calls and you're doing this behind the scenes you're not telling your players this this skill is going to be used this way this skill is going to be used that way that's not what you're doing you're just in the back of your head saying okay player player one comes up and wants to do something and you say okay make this check but player two wants to do something similar hey he's not going to make the same check he's going to make a slightly different check because something slightly different and you want your players stopping and thinking and taking careful consideration of what they're doing and that is keeping them engaged with the game while still slowing down the pace and you're using the mechanics to do it you're using your game master's discretion for what checks need to be made when and where specifically to make them think more cleanly about it so that they slow down the pace themselves while staying engaged. Now we move to the flip side. When you want the ticking time bomb, when you want them dreading that they haven't finished by the next second, you're almost going to do the exact opposite. And this can be in the same game. Let's say your horror game, the suspense has been building up. You've left them on the cliffhangers. You've had that creature in the back corner that's been just out of sight the whole time. And now, he's been revealed. Not because of a spot check, because you're probably going to be really careful about what information they can get with a spot check or something. You don't want them blowing the blowing the surprise and killing the tension just because one guy dumped a whole bunch of points into perception. But this is the reveal. It's moved out. It's made its first big attack. It's made its big first change. Whatever the case may be, now all of a sudden, the tension is released and we need it to release in a big way. So what are we going to do? Now, we're going to start trying to combine roles. We're going to start getting really broad with our skills. 
instead of, you know, the, this monster has come out, is chasing us out of the haunted house. We jump into the mo- we we jump into our modified hot rod and we tear off down the road, but we can't get away from it because it's that fast. This hellish beast that's been lurking in the shadows and just killed our friend is chasing us down the chasing us down the highway, and we're we're just flooring it. We've got our old 1930s Bentley with the 12 cylinder engine, and we're flying, and it's going to be a super exciting chase scene. We need adrenaline pounding. We need adrenaline pumping. We're coming up to the corner and one of us is going to jump out of the car and roll into the grass and duck down in the ditch because we want to get out of here. He's going to try and go for help while, while we distract the monster that's chasing us. He's going to run back to the house to try and get that that rocket launcher, that bazooka that was in the closet or that old, uh, you got an idea, he's going to grab that old underwater mine and try and set it up in a way where the bad guy, the monster, runs into it and blows up and this is the this is the way we're going to work on it. So he's going to jump out of the car. You do not want him making a jump check, a tumble check, a, uh, a hide check, an athletics check, and then a constitution check to see how he handles the damage. Rolling five and six checks. You just slowed that thing to a crawl with all these checks. Make the guy do, uh, have him do a tumble check and if it, and just gauge his success based on how well he does. If he fails, he's going to break his neck. If he fails but it's not that bad, he's going to get busted and beaten up on the way down. If he, you know, and, and maybe the monster's going to see him. If he succeeds but just barely, he's going to get kind of battered and bruised, but maybe the monster's going to miss him and he's a little hurt. If he succeeds by a lot, he's going to he's gonna slide down in there, go right into the ditch, and be perfectly hidden. And, heck, he might even have the opportunity to, as he's getting up to get out of there, to he notices a, a, a vine laying across the road or something that he can yank up and maybe make this monster stumble or something on the way to, while it's chasing the guys, give them a little bit of an edge. But the point is, is that I want these things now broad, Five minutes ago, I would have said I would have made that be like six checks because it was in a slow pace section where we're building tension, where we're building stuff. Now all of a sudden it's going to be one simple check. I'm not sitting here digging through things. Why? I want my players thinking faster. I want my players making snap decisions. I want my players saying they want to do something, and I'm immediately telling them the one role they need to make to try and make that happen because I want the adrenaline pounding in their head. I want everything fast paced. I want to quickly move to the next beat of the story. I'm still ticking the clock. But the difference is, is now I'm making it to where the second scene to fly as opposed to the second scene to drag out. That is one of the key things you have to do with your discretion as a game master. You have to remember, if you're an author, sometimes you would kill for something like this. A, a, a button that you can push to just dial up tension, a button you can push to just slow things down. You don't have to use some kind of narrative trick to drag it back to where it is. Heck, an author or a filmmaker, somebody kill for that. Just like we as game masters would kill for some of the things they have. But we're dealing with these players. We have to leave them their agency, let them do what they want to do. But we can use the mechanics and what roles we call for, what ideas we call for, and, if, uh, and even the decision on whether or not we even call for a role, we can use that to control the pace and to control the tension in that story, in that game. And even if it's just a simple hack and slash, we're not playing with any kind of story or anything. There's no intricate details. You can still do the same and slow your slow your adventuring and dungeon crawling down while speeding up your combat with the same kind of tricks, the same kind of discretion. And I know it seems that it goes against the old adage about consistency, but it really doesn't. It's just determining when and where to use which mechanics. That is, to me, the most important aspect in any tabletop role-playing game of how to use Game Master discretion. It is all about making decisions that are based on how you want that clock to tick at that point in time in the story. Do you want it to slow down and build tension? Do you want it to speed up and release tension and build action? And to me, 
this is how you develop those games where the players walk away from the table with their heart pounding in their ears, excited and wondering how it is that their heart rate is up and their palms are sweaty and they're breathing hard from sitting at a table rolling dice. It all comes down to controlling that narrative and don't forget to use those mechanics because it can enhance any other trick you use and it's the one trick your players are not looking for. They're looking for the long drawn out descriptions and other stuff you hear about how to make a story go faster or slower. They're not looking for you to just simply change the way you use the mechanics to make things go faster and slower and that makes it that much more effective. That's my thoughts on it. I'd love to hear yours. Give me some advice down in the down in the comment section. Tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I'm right. Tell me how you use mechanics to control pacing in your game. And then like, share, and subscribe. Send some people my way. And if you got a DM that you think use something like this, maybe a DM who, um, or maybe you are a DM who's writing their first campaign, stepping out away from modules for the first time. Come be part of the come be part of the family, and let's see if we can build something good together and create more game masters who are building memorable games through simple tricks like changing the mechanics. See you guys next time.